taking Black Hawk as a prisoner of war, Chief Black Hawk, as a prisoner of war down to, uh, I believe it was down to Missouri, where he was to be uh, turned over to the rest of the federal government. And Black Hawk wrote in his diary, or wrote in a letter to Davis about, let me quickly, this is what he said. The path of glory is rough and many gloomy hours obscure. And it's the Native American writing. May the great spirit shed light on you and may you never, listen to this, may you never experience the humiliation the power of the American government has reduced me to. Wow, talk about irony. There was a man Black Hawk, who was held prisoner. He was turned over to the Yankees who wanted to make a public spectacle out of him and hang him. <laughs> Same thing happened to Jefferson Davis. Go to the next slide very quick. Now, I like to say this because I like to upset people, especially people <coughs> who don't understand history, but Jefferson Davis was the South's last real president the last legitimate president. And why did I say that? Next slide. It's because of the Declaration of Independence. Well, we can't read all that, and I'm not going to read it, but the important part of it is the part that says governments or order are based upon the consent of the governed. And that any time a government is bad, we have a right to get rid of that government and institute new government. That is a birth certificate of two republics in America. The original republic in 1776 and the Confederate government in 1861. We like to, Don I say, the South was right in 1861 because America was right in 1776. So why do the opponents of the South, the haters of the South, why do they do always go over to the emotional issue. Oh, you were trying, you are a traitor, you are treason, uh, or you are racist, or you are, you're, they go to those emotional arguments because they don't have the facts. They don't have the truth. The facts and the truth would destroy their argument, but it also would call into question the very foundation of the government we live under today, a government that was not founded upon the consent of the governed, but by bloody bayonets. Bloody bayonets. And your ancestors' blood was on those bayonets. Go to the next slide. This is a picture of uh, a drawing of a fellow by the name of William Rawls. He did a, the first textbook used at West Point to teach the Constitution. Now, William Rawl was an abolitionist. He was from Pennsylvania. You know, so he wasn't a, a southern redneck trying to make a defense of slavery. No. Now, what did he say about secession? Very important because every one of our Confederate generals and officers who came from West Point, all of them said, we learned the right of secession at West Point. That was before it became... Woke point. <laughs> we learned it at West Point from William Ross, Judge Ross, uh, textbook. In chapter 32 of, of Ross's textbook, he describes the procedure by which a state may withdraw from the union. Stay in front of the camera. Uh, stay in front of the camera. Okay. Sorry about that. I like to run around. It's okay. Baptist background. But at any rate, he gives the, the procedure by which a state can secede from the Union. Taught at West Point by the federal government. Well, what about treason? Isn't Robert E. Lee a traitor? Let's get rid of all his monuments and, and tear them down because he's a traitor. He's a traitor to our America. No. Judge Raw in chapter 11 of his textbook has an entire chapter that says of treason against the United States. So he has a whole chapter about treason. Never is anything about 
secession mentioned as being treason. Why? Because he'd already said, how you do it? Next one, right quick. I'm running out of time. I never run out of enthusiasm, but uh, I know y'all are getting a little tired of listening. One nation indivisible. Now, huh. Alexander Hamilton, way back to Columbus, he wanted one imperialistic nation. Daniel Webster, one nation in there. Joseph's story was really a major problem with one nation indivisible. Abe Lincoln established one nation indivisible. The Republican Party during active, passive, and modern era of Reconstruction, they all believe in one nation indivisible. Woodrow Wilson, President Wilson, admitted to it. He said, the war between the states established this principle that the federal government is through its court the final judge of its own power. What dictator has more power if he can decide how much power he can exert? <clears throat> next, next one. Hmm. Yeah. Was it the war to destroy slavery or was it a war to destroy states' rights? Now we could, this is a great topic, but I'm just going to give you, uh, now what is this guy, Union General Colonel Robert Ingersoll, didn't he speak to the Republican, was it a Republican convention in 1880? Yes, he was a free thinker, what we would call today secular humanist, he was a somewhat of a radical socialist and uh, he was a real pro Lincoln, uh, pro radical Republican, and uh, he, he was a bad guy, folks. This is what he said. That great stumbling block, that great obstruction in Lincoln's way and in the way of thousands was the old doctrine of states' rights. So you see, it wasn't a war to destroy slavery. It was a war to destroy states' rights. Defense, not defiance. Next one. Let's see. States' rights in America. All right. States' rights in America's legitimate republic of sovereign states. This, up until 1861, this was, America was basically defined by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison in the Kentucky and Virginia Resolves of 1798. Uh, that's in the book, too, so you can take a read if you've never uh, heard about it. But this is basically what it says, that, that let me see, I'll just take a little bit of time and flip over here, because it's, this is the, uh, from the Kentucky Resolution, written by Thomas Jefferson. It says, Resolved that the several states composing the United States of America are not united on the principle of unlimited submission to the general government, but that by compact, under the style and title of the Constitution for the United States, that to this compact, each state acceded as a state, uh, that the government created by this compact, that's talking about the federal government, was not made the exclusive judge of the extent of the powers delegated to it. And in the Virginia resolves done by uh, J uh, James Madison, the powers of the federal government, it says, are limited by the plain sense and intention of the Constitution, and, it's no, and the, the, the federal acts are no further valid than they are authorized by that grant in the Constitution, and that in cases of deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the Constitution, the states who are parties to the Constitution have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of evil and the liberties that appertaining to that. In other words, the sovereign states, yes, I'm finished, the sovereign states have the ultimate, that is you, you and I, we the people of the sovereign states, we are the one. And this is what Jefferson Davis was fighting for. He came forward with a wonderful idea of the high road to emancipation. So when the slaves were uh, earned their freedom, they would be educated and prepared to be self-sustaining 
positive, contributing members of Southern society. Instead, through the efforts of bloody bayonets, they were forced down, <coughs> forced down the low road of emancipation, and you see what it brought us to. But also, it destroyed the constitutional principles on which our founding fathers established this country. And with that, I thank you for listening. God bless you. God bless you.